יש לומר. מזה מובן, in chapter 4, ומזה מובן, from the, all this that we've discussed it becomes clear, לזה שבעולם הבא יהיה גילוי ההמשכה שנמשכה על ידי קיום המצוות, מכיוון שגילוי זה יהיה בכללות גם בימות המשיח, אין זה אמיתות העניין לעולם הבא. So since we see that there are two aspects of receiving the reward for the mitzvot done in this world, part of it in the times of Mashiach and part of it in the world of the resurrection. So we can surmise that receiving the reward for the mitzvot is not the main part, it's not the main facet, the man, main characteristic of the world of the resurrection because part of that already existed in the times of Mashiach which comes before the world of resurrection. Why are you suddenly talking about Garden Eden? We're talking about times of Mashiach and world of resurrection. Times of Mashiach, okay. okay. The we see that even the times of Mashiach are built from the mitzvahs that we did. Okay. Except that what's revealed in the world of resurrection that wasn't revealed before, the causality. We said that that's the main thing, and <coughs> that in the world of resurrection it will be revealed. that what was created in the times of Mashiach, what was the new reality that's created, was a consequence, is a consequence of what we did by performing commandments in, in this world. Okay? Only in that time? Only in the world of resurrection will the causality be revealed. Meaning that in the times of Mashiach, we will already enjoy the fruits of our labors. But it won't be clear and apparent that what caused this all was the performance of mitzvot. And we talked about that yesterday, that in fact, the reason that the causality is not seen is because if the causality would be seen, then the further reward for doing more mitzvot, and there are still mitzvot in the time of, of, of Mashiach, you still perform mitzvot. It's not like the world of resurrection. In the world of resurrection, really the, the mitzvot are no longer mitzvot. Right, because they're not commanded anymore. So why would people do them? Because the causality will be revealed. Once the causality is revealed, there's no test in it. There's no, there's no free will in it. I mean, do you really have a choice whether or not to um, obey the law of gravity? I mean, you, you could theoretically not obey it, but you'd be out of your mind. Okay? Everybody understands there's something wrong with you if you do that, okay? and if you decide to walk off a building. So it's because you want to die. It's not because you're a, 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 a sane and, and a viv- vibrant p- person, right? So the moment the causality is revealed in the world of resurrection, the mitzvahs are no longer mitzvahs. They can't be commanded anymore. The whole idea of commandment is when I have an option, when I could do something else. Okay? And we said yesterday that during the times of Mashiach, there's actually... more intense work to be done. The mitzvahs are followed even in a more intense way. So, after all this, he says, it's clear that the main aspect of the world of resurrection is not the revelation of the causality of the, of the mitzvahs creating this new reality. Because the new reality already existed in part in the times of Mashiach. So that's not the main thing. It's just like a, an end of to the toil of doing mitzvot and seeing their reward. So what is the world of resurrection about? He says, The main facet, the most important characteristic of the world of resurrection is therefore the revelation of what we call Eden. We said that, now, now maybe that's why you mentioned the Garden of Eden before, when, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, so the sages say he was in the Garden, but he wasn't in Eden. They're the two separate things. He was in the Garden that was in Eden, meaning he, he understood the Garden, which needs to be tended, but he didn't understand, or he didn't 
he wasn't able to reveal what we call Eden. What's Eden? Eden is this Eden that we're talking about, which is what's revealed in the world of resurrection. And now he says is the main characteristic of the world of resurrection is the essential pleasure that God takes in the souls of the Jewish people. And not, sorry, not, not, which is higher than the pleasure he receives from the fact that we do mitzvahs. Okay? And that becomes the, the, the main facet of the world of resurrection. And a few places, the difference between Torah and mitzvahs is explained like this. The Torah, is Okay. The difference between them is that the pleasure that is enclosed in Torah is only a glimmer of the pleasure that's enclosed in the mitzvahs. The pleasure in the mitzvahs is much higher. That's why it's associated with the world of resurrection, because still the world of resurrection is related to the mitzvot. It's what's created from the mitzvot. But the most important thing there is the pleasure that was enclosed in the mitzvot. This was not revealed until now. Meaning the causality that's revealed in in the world of resurrection is one thing, and the pleasure that God takes in the performance of mitzvot is another thing altogether, and that's called Eden. And that's why the Torah says that a river came out of Eden to water the garden. What does it mean to water something? Okay. To water something... Okay. So it's like, a, it's a symbol, it's, a, it's an allegory for pleasure. That right? That water gives, uh, grows or gives a, a growth to all manners of pleasure. So whenever you talk about water, there's a, there's a, a, a subtext of there being pleasure there. So what happened here? That the pleasure came out of Eden, and it arrived in the garden. What did he do in the garden? He tilled it. He, he did the mitzvot. He did the commandments. Right? So that's the pleasure. Only had one what? Adam only had one no, he had two. No, he had both to eat and not to eat. Did he do that? He ate from, I don't know, but, but he had two, two commandments. One was to eat from all the trees of the garden, and the other was not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Okay. So he, sorry, he takes it in a different direction. He says, the, what we're talking about now is thinking about the Garden of Eden of the afterlife. He says, even in the afterlife, again, what are we doing in the afterlife? We're enjoying the Torah that we learned in this world. We're getting the inner meaning of it, how it sits with us. We, we got the Aliba we Dadate, got, we got the, um, everything that in this world we learned superficially. So in the afterlife, there's an there's a, a, an opportunity to go deeper into it. But he says all the joy, all, all the pleasure that one gets from learning Torah in the afterlife is considered only a hamshacha. It's only a small part that comes out of Eden. It's not Eden itself. That's why it's called the Garden of Eden. You're getting some pleasure from Eden, but as he says, it's only a glimmer of it. It's not the full Eden. Okay? But in the world of the resurrection, Eden itself is revealed. So what does that mean? That in the world of resurrection, you receive the full pleasure of Eden, which is God's pleasure from the souls of the Jewish people. 
And he receive, you and he receive some of that when you learn Torah, but you really receive it from doing mitzvahs. And it's revealed in the world of resurrection. And this is generally speaking. And as we said before, specifically speaking, that even though the Eden is revealed as like in the causality, when the causality is revealed, so you reveal the pleasure. Once you understand that every time you did a mitzvah, it created something. You understand that causality. Then you can understand the pleasure that God took in, 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 in each one of these mitzvahs. Why? Because it was building... It's like, it's like a person seeing the workers building his house. Right? So the, the workers don't necessarily know the guy who commissioned them. There's a contractor above and a, and a, a guy who oversees it and this and that. And from time to time, the guy who commissioned the house, he comes walking by. He doesn't, you don't see him come in a Mercedes or something. You don't know that he's the guy who has all the money. And he watches. And so, while he was watching, the workers were working. They didn't know there was any connection between this person and... Uh, and not only that, every worker has his own job. He doesn't see the full picture. So he doesn't understand really what what's going on. He only knows his particular thing. But when the house is complete and the owner comes to live in it, then suddenly all the people who worked on it, they understand a few things. First of all, they understand what they did. They understand how their job was part of the bigger picture. How it was causally connected to creating this house. But moreover, they now see the person who's living in it. And they realize what pleasure he received from every brick that they laid. They couldn't see that until now, because you couldn't see Hashem didn't reveal the Eden. The Eden is like revealing his pleasure in what you did. Now, how is that revealed? Obviously, it has to do with the revelation of Hashem. You're saying Hashem reveals himself in some way. And so you begin to understand everything. But, he says that there are two parts to it. The first part is that the house stands erect. And then you understand the causality of what you did. As a worker, you understand what you did, what you contributed to this big picture. But you don't yet understand the pleasure that the owner received. When do you receive, when do you understand that pleasure? When he shows up and lives in the house. So he says in the world of resurrection, there are these two aspects. The first aspect is when you see the world of resurrection, then you causally understand even more than you did. It's like in, in, um, in, in the times of Mashiach, like the house is already there, but you didn't even know that you were working on this house. Because it was dark. You didn't, you didn't see where you were. Or every day they brought you and they took you away. You, don't, you didn't know where it was. And so you see this magnificent palace now. And you're, wow, this is pretty amazing. And they tell you, you can, you can go in. Then they tell you, this is what you worked on. You laid the bricks here. And then you begin to understand, wow, you, you begin to get pleasure from, but it's only a glimmer of the pleasure. The real pleasure is when, so that's in the times of Mashiach. So you, get to, you get to be in that house without even knowing that you built it. The world of resurrection is when suddenly you realize, I built this. And you see the causality between this magnificent building and what you did. And suddenly you're filled with, with pleasure from what you did. The causality gives you pleasure. But it's still not who this belongs to. That's the final stage of the world of res resurrection. 
And when Hashem appears in the house, and you see His pleasure from the totality of it, that is what He calls, that's the main aspect. So what is His pleasure? So His pleasure is not just in the house. It's in all the workers that were there, because He watched them the whole time. He knew the whole time that they were the ones building this. And so He now wants to throw a big party to show His appreciation for what was done. It says that's the main aspect of the world of resurrection, if I'm allowed to use this uh, metaphor, in this whole allegory. But you understand the different stages. We'll see the, the intense, essential pleasure that he takes in the souls of Israel. Again, not because of what they did, because it's already done. That he got when he saw it do- being done. It's that we're all... Pa- we're all the same here. We all work together to make this building. We all work together to make this project, whatever this project was. The project is, of course, the world of resurrection. Okay. And it's higher than even the pleasure that he took in each brick being laid or each part of the project being done. So, it can happen in a moment. We're building the world of resurrection for 2,000 years. It's very interesting to say that because what did, it, what did God build? Did He build any of the interactions in the world or did, did He just build the, um, infrastructure. the infrastructure? And it, it would seem, that, and that's why Hasidah says this, that that the reason we know we're at the end now is because we're building the most spiritual part of it now. The like the Rebbe says in Sichos and different uh, discourses that um, the fact that Hasidus deals with human psychology that's the that's the most intricate part of the creation of the world that man is doing now and building your internal world. You can say that many generations, it's not that they didn't have mental issues and they didn't have psychological problems, but they were still building the infrastructure. They, they were still working on interactions that had to do with the infrastructure. And now, the infra- you can say the infrastructure is in place. There's enough food to feed the world without... Right. And now it's just, so what do we say to each other? What do we say to ourselves? That becomes the, the, the what, that's what we're building. Okay. Fifth chapter. Uviur ha'iluy detchiyat ha'metim legabei yomot ha'mashiach. Ve'al der zeh ha'chiluk sheben shtei ha'dorgot shebetchiyat ha'metim gufa. So he wants to better explain. I tried to explain now, but he's going to hopefully do a better job. That the superiority of, of the world of resurrection to the times of Mashiach. Okay? So to understand why Yemot Mashiach, the times of Mashiach, are higher than the, than the afterlife, than the Garden of Eden, we can understand by... Sorry, to understand the, the, how... The world of resurrection is higher than the world, uh, times of Mashiach. We can understand how the times of Mashiach are, are higher than the afterlife. The revelation in the Garden of Eden and the afterlife is specifically for b- souls without bodies. But the, but the times of Mashiach are here in this physical world. So the revelation is also physical. It's not just spiritual. Okay? And as the sage has said in a, in a metaphor, that the land of Israel is destined in the times of Mashiach to bring out Luskot is like a huge um, fruit. The reason for this is that the 
revelation of godliness in the afterlife, in the Garden of Eden, where there's only a soul and no body, is because the light is limited. It's finite light. It's finite revelation. Finite revelation, as we know, can only become spiritual. It can't become physical. Okay? Very important. We've talked about this many times. That finite, memale, spiritual. right? Finite light, the light that fills all worlds, and spiritual are almost synonymous. But if you want to create something or have impact on that which is infinite, uh, sorry, and that which is physical, you have to have light that's infinite. You have to have what we call the surrounding light. And it's one of the reasons why a soul in the afterlife can't have an impact normally on us. Because we're very physical. Okay? Because we're so physical, how can the soul impact someone who's physical? If the only thing you understand is a patch, <laughs> the soul can't do anything for you. Right? The soul in the afterlife. So you have your dearly departed father, and he can't tell you, don't do this, it's bad for you. Because the only thing you understand is getting a slap. It's something physical. When something physical goes wrong, then you understand. But if nothing physical goes wrong, you think everything is fine and dandy. You don't understand. So how can he get the message across to you? But people who are very spiritual, whose language is spiritual, they can understand what a soul in the afterlife is saying. And because the soul has limited light, but it has some light at its disposal. It can do things. And so it can tell the person something. There is a way to communicate, but the communication is spiritual. It's not physical. That's what people, you know, they always joke. Nobody ever came back from the afterlife. We don't know what it's like. It's not true. And nobody ever came back physically. But it's not true that they don't come back spiritually. Of course they come back. <laughs> the, the Talmud is full of them. The whole Zohar was written in that way. And the whole Zohar, whenever it was written, is... If it was written in the time of Rashbi, and not by Rashbi, but by his students, so it contains discussions, you know, whole sections of a spiritual connection with Moshe Rabbeinu. The whole Raya Mehemna in the Zohar is that whoever that sage was, they spiritually connected to Moses. And even though Moses is not in the world physically, they had a conversation with him. And same thing with Eliyahu. Eliyahu is a little bit different because he has a special quality, unlike everybody else, that he does have some ability to affect the physical world because he entered with his body, as it were. That's how it's described. Meaning, when you say he entered with his body, you're saying he entered with some of the abilities that a soul in a body has some the, to, to affect something uh, physical. What? Really He died. He's not here. He's not alive. But he took with him, he was able to take with him some of the aspects of the light that's infinite. That you only have when you have the body. He was able to take it with him. That's the Chiddush. There were ten people altogether, it says in the Medrash, that were able to enter the Garden of Eden with some aspect of this infinite light. So the Zohar is full of it. And then the, the, the Shas is full of it. Uh, that, and that's what the Rebbe did okay? the Rebbe every time he went to the Tzion to the Friediger Rebbe's grave site he spoke to him how can you speak to him isn't that what's called questioning the dead isn't it forbidden so I'm not getting into all the halachic things which are it's not it's just not it's something completely different but the very fact that the Torah forbids Asking the dead, and questioning the dead, really what it means is praying to the dead. You don't pray to them. But you can talk to them. And it depends on what, on what, kind, what the conversation is about. Okay. The conversations that would be incorrect uh, regardless, <laughs> even if the person was alive. And there are conversations again. If I ask you, so, Yaakov, what's going to be the price of Bitcoin in, in three months? Yeah. yeah. 
So that's a stupid, a stupid question anyway to anybody. It doesn't matter how smart you are. So if that's the type of questions you're going to ask, you're better off not asking. But if you're saying, let's analyze the current situation. What's going on now? Let's understand what's going on now. I need... So that's a different, a different proposition altogether. You can ask smart people, what do you think is happening right now? To say what's going to be, that's nonsense. So, in any case... Well, what do you mean hasn't been decided? It's... Uh, how the future is going to affect you has not been decided. That's true. But the future is the future. It's, it's already there. <laughs> For Hashem, it already exists. What your role will be has not been decided. And the, the future is given. It's, it's already decided. From the moment that God created the world, He decided what, what the whole span of history would look like. But He leaves to you to decide how you're going to be affected by it. He leaves to you to decide what you're going to do with it. That has not been decided. So the question of um, how much will... You know, it's, a, it's a stupid question, right? The person assumes everything will be the same. If nothing will be the same. <laughs> I mean, in three months, who knows where you're going to be? Maybe you won't care the least bit in three months. I mean, you're going to put all your money in. And for whatever reason, it will be meaningless to you in three months. A million million scenarios I can think of right now that would make money meaningless to you. Mamash meaningless. So it's a stupid question. What do you care? The question is, what are you doing now? So that, that type of question that he talks with his deceased father-in-law about, there's something there. But that, that, that's called... It's called... Uh, it's called placing yourself on the, on the grave of, of the deceased. And that, that exists. And that, why is it possible? Because he's so spiritual. Because he's not physical. He doesn't, he doesn't understand only physical uh, gestures. The Rebbe understands spiritual gestures. So he can understand, he can hear things that you and I can't hear. When he looks at a person, he hears the soul. How can he hear the soul? What he has some, uh, some other... Uh, he has a yeah, listening device. No, his mind is attuned to things that you and I don't see. We just don't see it. It's in front of us. We look at it. But we don't see it. We don't understand what it means. Hmm. But here's that understanding. Don't we hear it, but we don't understand what it means. But we don't even hear it. I know, I don't, again, I don't think it's a physical... It's a, it's a question of physical ability. It's a question of, of spiritual interpretation. We don't know what these things mean. Why do we, know, why do we not know? So once the Rebbe told the Rav Steindels, Rav Steindels asked him, if you would have known that you would, have been Re- that you would be Rebbe in the end, what would you have done differently? He says, I would have spent less time on secular subjects. He was very surprised. He asked him why. So because if I would have learned something more, I would be able to help another Jew. He's saying that the spiritual interpretation comes from learning Torah. The Torah makes you more spiritual. Other things don't make you spiritual. They don't, they don't teach you the spiritual language so that when you talk to someone, you understand what their soul is saying, not just what they think they're saying. Right. He did. <laughs> I guess. He used to laugh at himself that he's not spiritual. He definitely used to laugh at himself that he doesn't understand anything spiritual. He said, everybody understands except for me. Everybody has Ruach HaKodesh but me. <laughs> you can take it any way you want. <laughs> I think that really, in the end, he even if he understood certain things, he he never talked about them, and he and he didn't let them um, change his judgment about things. And if he did, it was very subtle. He would never let let in on it. 
Maybe some people he formed an opinion of very quickly because he understood spiritually where they were and maybe he understood there's no point in, in trying to uh, invest time in them. And so he just uh, nodded them off quickly and didn't, didn't do it. But I think the fact that he was drawn to certain individuals and he spent a lot of time with them, it was from the first moment that he saw them, it was like he, he f- they found, like, he saw something spiritual in them that, that he thought was worth investing in. He didn't do that with everybody. It wasn't... Uh, so I think he saw things, but he never talked about it that way. The, the Rebbe also didn't speak about these things. It wasn't like he revealed, you know, this is what I see. The only story that I know, I told you about the, the guy who came to ask for children... And he told him to put up uh, silk curtains in his uh, in his bedroom. That's the type of thi- of seeing something spiritual. Which, uh, when you hear the story, it's like, huh? <laughs> it's just the thought that comes through your mind. That's the spiritual thing. That's a big deal. So, by a person like this, thoughts don't just come. You know, they don't just fill the mind suddenly. He understands also what they mean when they do come into his mind. He has, he has a way of understanding what, what that sentence from that song means. A song from the Arizal. It's, it's, a, it's a different level of, of life because he understands, um, he has control of his mind. This is the thing I just heard from someone that uh, the Rev Ginsburg <laughs> said that most of the problems in life come because people think too much. Too much. So you don't need to think. <laughs> you can understand that however you want. Okay. How much petrol do you have to on the light comes on as you know, I guess? When did it come on? Huh? Just now? No, no, it hasn't come on. Oh, no, so you, you could probably get to uh, Tel Aviv easily.